Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna hadha al-Qur'ana yahdi lillati hi aqwam. Indeed, this Qur'an guides humanity to that which is best. Best in form, best in manner, best in result, best in path. The term Quran, you know, the Arabs, they use, they were very impressed when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with this concept of Quran. Because water was so scarce in the desert, whenever it rained, what they would do is that they would dig in the, in the desert and they would put a bucket in that hole that they dug and then they would draw little streams that lead to the bucket. So whenever it rains, the little streams will take the water into that bucket. And that bucket was called the Quran. So when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and he said, I have a Quran for you, everyone was expecting water in a bucket. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, this is the Quran to be recited, is to be taught, to be said. In other words, the water satisfies your physical thirst. The Quran satisfies your physical and your spiritual thirst. So make sure that whenever we are reading the Quran, embarking the Quran, that we are fed intellectually as well as spiritually. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those not only recite the Quran by their tongues, also implement it by our limbs. Allah knows best. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Inshallah, let's, let's uh, go to the question and answer sessions. Assalamu alaikum. Is it not must for women to attend Juma prayers in the light of Quran? Quranic verse. Yes, um, the question is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, iza nudi alis salat mi yom il jumati fasau ila dikrilahi wadarul bayah. Said, O you who believe, when the prayers for the Friday prayers have been called, hasten to the remembrance of Allah and abandon or leave your transactions or your, uh, your work for that particular time during the Salah. And the brother is asking, the khitab or the address here is Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. And whenever Allah says Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, it is for men and for women as well. So how come uh, it's not a must upon women to attend the Jum'ah prayers? This is what we call the khitab or the address may have been a general one but the intended people were, were a specific number of them. For example, because not every time there is a command in the Quran, it means that it makes it a wajib. The very next part of the surah, When the prayers are over, you go about and you try to gain your livelihood again. If I want to say in the masjid, am I violating the verse because the verse said after the salah you go about, I want to say in the masjid. So it was in the sense that sometimes it is given in the sense of recommendation. Women have been exempted from Jum'ah prayers by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Did not make it a must upon them. And it is very common in the Quran that there is a nas or a text that is very general that yet there are exceptions from that command. So women are not obligated to attend the Jum'ah prayers, the Friday prayers. However, if a woman wants to attend the Jum'ah prayers and it is highly recommended for her to do so because of the benefits, because of the virtues of the Jum'ah, she should not be uh, prevented from doing so. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تمنعوا إماء الله من مساجد الله Do not prevent the female servants of Allah from attending the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if she wants to go there. And I think that also it is really important then when we are building our masajid or organizing for such events that we facilitate that our sisters become part of this. And that is why it is very common that during the time of the Prophet wasallam, women were always in the masjid. In fact, the person that was taking care of the masjid during the time of the Prophet wasallam, was a woman. And one day she was cleaning the masjid, maintaining the masjid. So one day the Prophet ﷺ came and for two days she is not there. And he said, where is that woman that used to take care of the, of the masjid? 
And they said, the, the, the hadith said, Fataqaluha. She passed, uh, she passed away, and some of the companions, they belittled her, her, uh, her, her position, and they said, you know, the Prophet ﷺ is too busy to be informed about such a thing. And the Prophet ﷺ was mad, and he said, why did you not inform me? And he went to her grave, and he prayed there. He offered janazah prayers on her grave. What an honor that is. But if our women, if our sisters want to come to the salah, they should not be prevented from it. And always make sure that we facilitate for them to be part of it, so long that their, their uh, responsibilities are home are not, um, are not compromised. Allah Ta'ala Jalla Allah knows best. Brother Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, you are told that um, we have to glorify Allah Ta'ala and only Allah Ta'ala. But nowadays we see our children, that is boys and girls, including the adolescent, they are naturally um, tempted to observe glorifications which are uh, available in the TV and other channels, including cricket. But my question is whether it is possible immediately to bring our people back to glorify Allah or it is a slow process uh, so that some parents say let them allow let us allow these people to observe all these things and later they would come to know about what is right and what is wrong and uh, they will develop uh, God consciousness and all so what is the way whether it is a slow process or we have to immediately do something on that Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum the brother's question was regard to what is what we see nowadays in the media and who is glorified like what was said earlier and because the nature of young uh, boys and girls, young men and women, is that they're very impressionist. They like to impression and they impersonify the person that they see. Especially the way that these people are glorified, like I said earlier, you know, with all the fame and the glamour that is given to them. Well, if you do not stop this process, modify it initially from the very beginning, it is very difficult, you know, once they are old, it's very difficult to do anything about it. Because they say, Whoever raised in a particular way, you know, loving, liking certain things, certain people, what have you, later on, this is how they're going to grow up to be. So you cannot wait until they grow up and, and that happens. And that is why we see that the Prophet was very keen in instilling good character in children, even at young age. Like we know the story. The old woman, she was talking to her child and she said, come, I'd like to give you something. And when he came, she gave him a piece of date. And before that, the Prophet ﷺ said, do you really mean to give him something? And she said, yes, of Prophet of Allah, I would like to give him dates. And the Prophet ﷺ said, had you not done so, it would have been recorded against you as a lie. Even though it's a child. But the Prophet ﷺ is saying that consistency is very important. And this is one more thing, my brothers and sisters. Hope you memorize it, inshallah. Children, attention pay to what we do, not what we say. Children, attention pay to what we do, not what we say. We may, you know, say things, but you say, oh, you know, don't worry about it, you know, but then we've got the TV on and we're watching the same people that we're telling them not to glorify. Every time they come on TV, the parents are rushing in to see, you know, oh, she or he is really on TV and they're watching. That's what they pick on. They don't pick on what we say because children are never good in listening to their elders, but they never fail in imitating their elders. So now the question is, what kind of example are you setting? And like the brother said, you know, the process is a slow, but it must be assured in a sense that uh, it took a long time for us to get where we are right now. And to expect that a change can happen overnight is very difficult. Another point also is that alternatives, I think, is the biggest challenge that we have. TV is, is extremely, extremely, you know, amazing. It, it just does the most fabulous, wonderful, you know, unimaginative things. Why do you think children watch TV? Some would say because it's very entertaining. Some would say it's very fun. Some would say it is very uh, informative. And this may be true reasons. But I think that the reason why children watch TV is because TV is never too busy to talk to them. TV is never too busy to talk to them. Rather, TV tells you, you come at 3 a.m., 3 p.m., I'll be there for you. If you're bored, I will entertain you. If you want information, I will teach you. If you want to be happy, I'll, all you have to do is just press that button, and I will, I will respond right away. With parents, go away, go away, you know. 
reading the paper now, or I'm on the phone right now, or you know, I'm doing this right now. But TV, you know, never a child ever goes to TV and the TV says, I have a headache, not today, or you know, not feeling good. They don't do that. So the challenge is now in what kind of alternatives are we giving? When you say it's haram, that's not where it stops. If you say it's haram or it's not right or it's wrong, then what kind of alternative are you giving? And that is why, again, conferences like these, they can really provide our young brothers and sisters, you know, with people to look up to. Our ultimate objective is to lead and live a life like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Now, this is the ultimate person that we look up to, but in our daily lives, you know, it helps that we, there is someone that we can say, you know, I want to be like that person, I want to be like her, I want to be like him. And that is where we can present, you know, in such a fashion, bring in brothers and sisters, where our young brothers and sisters, they look up to them and they say, I won't be like him and I won't be like her. Wallahu alam, Allah knows best. <laughs>but you do not understand what is being read. Now we can read the Quran for the sake of barakah, for the sake of blessings in Arabic. But if we are seeking hidayah from that book, it must be read in a language that we understand. For me to tell you, you know, you must learn Arabic may not be practical for some of us. But the idea is you must read it in a language that you understand the message of the Quran. And I'll tell you right now that many times, you know, we can read the Quran, I can teach someone how to read the, the alphabets, but it won't do them any good. And that is not the essence or the idea behind the reading of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times says, This is indeed a blessed book that we have descended down upon you, so follow the commands of that book. How can I follow commands that I don't even understand what these commands are saying? And that is why one time, the Prophet never made a big deal of this. One time, a Bedouin came to the Prophet Sallam, and you know what happened is that they took their shahada, and then the Prophet Sallam would tell them to go and with a companion and teach them Quran. And there was this Bedouin, just could not, could not memorize any part of the Quran. You know, come on, he spoke Arabic, and the Prophet Sallam would say, repeat after me, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi, could not do it. Qul Allahu Ahad, and he just could not memorize any part of the Quran. So the Prophet Sallam said, when you stand in your prayer, say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, glorify Allah in such a fashion. And many times, you know, us Arabic speaking people, we make it very difficult for, no, for our non Arabic speaking brothers and sisters when we put this burden on them that you must learn. It'll be nice if you can learn it. 
But learning Arabic is one thing. Understanding the Quran and the statements of the Prophet وسلم, is something else. So I would say read the Quran in a language that you understand and inshallah you will be rewarded as much as the person who is reading it in Arabic. Because by the end of the day, you may be reading the translation of the meaning and that person may be reading the Quran, but each and every one of you is doing according to their ability. And that is why Allah is so just that when he rewards or punishes, part of what is taken into consideration is whether we had the ability or we did not have the ability. Someone who is rich is not treated as someone who is poor. Someone who is intelligent is not treated as someone who is average. Someone who had the ability will not be treated as someone who did not have the, the ability. And also the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever recites the Quran and is very well versed with it will be with the, with the Kiran Barara, with the angels, you know. And then who said that whoever recites the Quran and has difficulty in the recitation of the Quran, then he will be rewarded twice. One for the effort and another one for the actual translation. Now don't misunderstand me and not learn Arabic because you want the double, um, the double reward there. Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sir, I listened to you talking about the day of judgment and accounts. Your talk has made me remind myself of some of the ahadiths which I have read. And I, have, and I want some clarifications from you on that. Uh, I have read an ahadith in which it has been said that he who stands to be reckoned on the day of judgment will be punished. One. Another ahadith is Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has said that 70,000 of my ummah will go to heaven without reckoning. When the Sahaba wanted to know more about this from Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as to who they were, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, mentioned that they are those, one, they are those who do not take an ill omen in anything, two, they are those who do not cauterize themselves, number three, and they are those who put their trust in Allah. And I feel, I want to know, sir, that don't you think that the number 70,000, right from the time when the message of Allah came to us till the day of judgment is too little? Taking into consideration the fact that the first one says that he who stands to be reckoned on the day of judgment will be punished. Lest somebody gets disheartened by what I say. I also remember one ahadith which says, that on the day of judgment, an angel will come and it will pick up three types of person. First, an angel will come and ask, who are those who glorified Allah, both in adversity and in prosperity? And an angel will come, pick them up and send them to heaven without reckoning. Two, one more angel will come and it will be asked, who are those who praised Allah in the darkness of the night? They will be picked, sent to heaven. And the third type, an angel will come and ask, who are those whom trade and business did not distract from the worship of Allah? And it seems reckoning will start after this. And I fear this very much, primarily because I remember one more ahadith. It says that once Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had a dream, and he said that he went and saw the heaven. There it seems he found that a majority of them were poor. And then when he looked into the hell, it seems a majority of them were the women. My question is, being a believer in Allah, all of us, anybody who uh, declares shahadat will one day be sent to heaven. But what I really fear the most is the day of reckoning, which runs for thousands and thousands of years. What can we as Muslim, especially Muslim women do, to save ourselves from the day of judgment and reckoning on the Day of Judgment. Thank you. Jazakallah uh, khair. Very, very briefly, I will say this in principle. The Prophet ﷺ and the Quran, when they, whenever they speak on the issue of heaven and hell, we are given guidelines. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, لَلْجَنَّةُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَىٰ أَحَدِكُمْ مِنْ شِرَاكَيْنَ عَلِهِ He said that paradise is closer to one of you than his shoelaces. He said, this is how close paradise is. And so is the hellfire. Meaning that you have the option. It is a matter of choices that you make. The choices that you make will, may, may lead you there. Choices that you make may lead you somewhere else. So it said, be aware of the type of choices that you make. 
That is really what it says in Islam. Be aware of the type of choices. It speaks of poor people, rich people, women, and women. No one goes to heaven or to hell because of their gender or because of their social status. That is just, that is not fair. However, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would speak to the poor people and he would say, the Prophet ﷺ would say, as a way of condoling them. You know, you are poor, you are this, and you are that. So a way of condoling them, the Prophet ﷺ would say, well, wouldn't it please you that you be in paradise? This is not to, be, to mean that the poor are favored over the rich. Rather, it is with what you have, what did you do? So if you were a rich person and you were able to impact as many people as possible, you are indeed a better person than who was rich and only uh, a poor that only impacted himself or a rich person that did not do much for the people that were around him. So again, in Islam, لَيْسَ insani إِلَّا مَا سَعَى that man will only be rewarded according to his deeds. That is what it is. Regardless of your gender, social status, color of your skin, or any of that, these are irrelevant matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, sometimes we speak of paradise and what takes you to paradise, and we make it so difficult. But that is not the case of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A man comes to him and says, Prophet of Allah, tell me this. You mean to tell me that if I pray five times a day, and I do my zakah if I have to, and I do my hajj if I can, and I do my siyam, and I do my sadaqah, I will go to paradise. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, you go to paradise. And the man could not believe it. He said, by Allah, I will not do an atom extra beyond this. Now some of us would say, you know, this is lousy. What does that mean? You only do your five daily prayers. You only do your zakah when you have to. And you do your Ramadan, and that is the end of it. You know the comment of the Prophet وسلم, said? He said, Aflaha in sadaq. The man will be successful, will be prosperous if he keeps his promise. What was his promise? I do my five daily prayers, I do my zakat, and I do my Ramadan. He, he did not have the ability to do hajj or did not have the ability to do hajj and sadaq. But anyways, so this is how easy the Prophet وسلم, has made it. Have a good character and that's what we say. Uh, uh, the heaviest on the scale of the deeds of a mu'min, of a believer, is good character. Said so you have a good character, that's where you end up. And again, the Prophet ﷺ said that a man, due to his good character, will be in the company in the day of resurrection of those who prayed all night long and those who pray or fasted all day long. This is what it is. So in Islam, we would say it is the character and the consciousness, Iman and Amal al-Salih. Iman would be God conscious, and Amal al-Salih would be have good character, especially with the way you, you interact and behave with other people. And this goes to both men and women, rich and poor, and do what you can with what you have, where you are at this point. And we would say, subhanAllah, going to paradise is very easy, and let's not, inshallah, complicate the teachings of Muhammad uh, وسلم, and also very important, let us understand in context what the Prophet is saying. Very numerous times we pick a hadith or we pick a verse and we would be so depressed over what we read. Like the sister said, I think 70,000 is too little of a number. But the numbers usually when they are used by the Prophet وسلم, when they are used in the Quran, they are not meant like that. This is how the Arabs would exaggerate. You know, they would use these numbers, 70,000 numbers. You know, people tell me, when do we pick you up? And I say, in five minutes. Do I really mean five minutes? I'm speaking metaphorically. So likewise, the Prophet وسلم, would use such numbers as a metaphorical way of exaggerating. So 70 may be small, but in the, Arab, in the, in the, in the Arabic language, whenever the term 70,000 is used, it is used as a means of exaggeration, not necessarily a means of limiting um, to that. And again, remember that the bounties of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the grace of Allah is beyond of course, as we know, 70,000, Allah does not look forward to putting people in hell, but it is the type of choices that they make that is leading them in that place. Imagine, one deed you do, you get 10 times the reward. You do one bad deed, you are only punished once. So if your once outweigh your tens, then you really deserve to be there. You're getting the idea? If a good deed is rewarded 10 times, and a bad deed remains one, so your ones are so numerous that they outweigh your tens. Whose fault is it? It is your fault. And it, we cannot really attribute that to anything but the consequences of our choices and Allah knows best. Is hypnotism, auto-suggestion, 
and reading of books written by secular authors like uh, Dale Carnegie and others. Is it permissible in Islam? Uh, the question is regarding reading some secular books uh, that are not necessarily Islamic. I do believe that some of the books that are out there are very beneficial. Uh, you may read them and things that uh, go in accordance with Islam. I believe some many times I've found a good number of them to be very good. So if you're able to distinguish what is good, take it in, and that which is not what that which is bad or anti-Islam or does not conform with the teachings of Islam, I say reject uh, reject that. But I I would do recommend these books by Del Carnegie. And Allah knows best. Salam alaikum. <laughs> humanity to that which is best best in form best in manner best in result best in path <laughs> the term Quran you know the Arabs they use they were very impressed when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came with this concept of Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم. Indeed, this also implemented by our limbs. Allah knows best. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Inshallah, let's, let's uh, go to the question and answer sessions. Assalamu alaikum. Is it not must for women to attend Juma prayers in the light of Quran? Quranic verse. Yes, um, the question is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, Ida nudi alis salatimi yomil jumati fasaw water in a bucket. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No, this is the Quran to be recited, is to be taught, to be said. In other words, the water satisfies your physical thirst. The Quran satisfies your physical thirst and your spiritual thirst. So make sure that whenever we are reading the Quran, embarking the Quran, that we are fed intellectually as well as spiritually. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those not only recite the Quran by their tongues, because water was so scarce in the desert, whenever it rained, what they would do is that they would dig in the, in the desert and they would put a bucket in that hole that they dug and then they will draw little streams that lead to the bucket. So whenever it rains, the little streams will take the water into that bucket. And that bucket was called the Quran. So when Muhammad came and he said, I have a Quran for you, everyone was expecting 